so when you were you were talking, and I love both of the presentations, by the way. Um, you suggested that we want a really high vote for this uh, referendum. We want 70s and 80s and 90s. And there's part of me that went, doesn't that just mean we asked a really weak question? Uh, wouldn't it be better to push it and to get the, the kind of question that has real impact? I think we'd struggle to get more than 60%. Uh, and most of the referendums in Australia that have had a real impact, other than that, that one, you know, they've, they've, they haven't got, they've been in the 50s, you know, and they've given real powers, like the power to be able to get free drugs and you know, that sort of stuff. Um, so yeah, what, what, what do you say to that, that idea that it would be better to push it further and mm, and get a slimmer majority rather than try to bring everybody along with us? My short answer, my short kind of blunt answer is I would want more and more Australians to vote um, in the positive. I would want the higher number. And the reason why I would want the higher number is I think there is already too much um, uh, negativity around issues of the relationship with other people, too much negativity around the relationship with people of other ethnicities or race, and we as a country, we have a very poor way of showing the beauty of our relationship with our First Peoples. The stuff that, you know, the best that we've seen in the reconciliation movement is where we talked about our common destiny. We talked about how we need each other in the, the crafting of our, of our culture and our identity. The worst of it is when we started to say, well, we don't want Aborigines to get, you know, a, a higher thing of citizenship than us. You know, the worst of it is when we saw people say, oh, we want to acknowledge them, but we don't want them to have our backyards. And what this moment can, can offer is an opportunity for us to have a moment where we say, yes, we as a country, we acknowledge that they're the first peoples. And we as a country don't want the constitutional um, power to, um, to have uh, racially discriminatory laws. That's what we want. We want, we want the racism out and we want the recognition in. Now, doing that though, it comes to a technical thing. Do you want it general or, 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 or strong enough? The more we wrestle for the stronger and stronger words, I think the less likely we are to have a sense that we can stand united as Australians. Now this is gonna be difficult. We're all gonna to have to make our own personal choice um, to, when, when the, 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 the question gets formed. But one of the great things about a referendum change, is it's, a, it's not a spectator sport. We are all in it. And my vote is just as strong as anyone else's vote in wanting to make this change. In that sense, there's no classism, there's no um, political class and, you know, people, it's all of us, we get a chance to say that, that is the kind of Australia I want to live in. Now, just the other final point I want to say to that is that um, one of the younger Aboriginal staff for Recognise, she's, she's not with us anymore, but she started to talk about how she wants to feel on the Sunday morning when she walks around. We all know that it won't change overnight you know, but it will happen. It's kind of like that ad, you know, with a hair wash, you know, it won't change overnight, but it will happen. But what we will know is that she said, I want to be able to walk around and say, nine out of 10 of these people voted to recognize me. Nine out of 10 or eight out of 10 of these Australians said, yeah, I don't want racism in my constitution and I want to recognize the first peoples. On that very basic level, it, it is so worth trying to get it to its highest numbers. And if that means, you know, and I don't want to, you know, um, if that means that the question might be more general than tough, then I would want the higher numbers because I think the country needs it. When I joined Aboriginal rallies in support of the First Peoples, I always hear sovereignty never ceded. Uh, I was thinking, is are there have there been any endeavors to develop? a constitution of the First Peoples so that that way sovereignty may be reasserted and this time with such a constitution, which, with a, such a document, we ask the Australian people to recognize it 
and therefore recognize not just uh, the illegality of racism, but the recognition of the sovereignty of the First Peoples that was never seen. There is some interesting work being done around native title and whether or not we're getting to a critical mass of people who have formerly had the native title rights recognised or have been through some process where you could have a genuine Congress. And there's been sort of several meetings. I know Tony McAvoy was one of the people who was organising. Um, there's been a few forums and they've been the start of documents. Um, and there have been at different points of time, and I'm going back in my mind a little bit in terms of, you know, since the 30s there have been forums that have been national of different Aboriginal groups that have gotten together and produced various kinds of documents. But to be honest, there's always been a lot of debate about the legitimacy and the buy-in, and that partly comes from what a huge and diverse country we are. And if you have hundreds of different languages and hundreds of different nations and it is incredibly difficult, and, and people who don't have a lot of money, frankly, to organise the kind of infrastructure you would need to successfully get everybody together to make that work. Now, whether we're reaching a tipping point where that changes because technology has changed, and because also um, a real economic base is being built up by groups that have won native title, um, that, that is going to shift. But I know there's been lots of interesting historical examples. I just wouldn't, I don't think there's one you could say people have sort of said, yeah, that's the one, that was our moment, we all got behind that one, in terms of different Aboriginal groups, and but the government didn't listen to us, there's just been kind of pockets of, at different times. Would you agree with that, Mark? There's, there's been no definitive um, uh, process or document production where people could say, or right across all of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Australia, that represents something of a, a constitution for First Peoples. The closest we have got to a unified positioning to say this is what we declare was somewhere between 79 and 88. Through that decade, we went from the kind of conversation about um, uh, the kind of conversation about a, a, a national treaty process and the um, Barunga statement. Um, of being able to say these are the sorts of things that we declare as people. That's the closest we've been able to to say um, this has got broad support. But uh, Sylvia's right, the, the, the level of diversity amongst um, our communities and the, the, the various ways that people have been trying to say what kind of positioning do we need? Do we need a positioning that, that says we want to closely align ourselves with this regime of Australia because we want to be recognised as part of it, or is our job to step away from this regime of Australia and to declare ourselves separate? And even on that basis, we still haven't got um, a sufficient agreement to be able to say, we're, you know, there'll be, there'll be one camp over here saying we declare ourselves separate, and another camp over here saying our job is to, is to, is to work with this regime. We haven't even sorted that level out yet. That doesn't mean that these processes can't happen, it means that there, it's challenging for us to be able to work through those effectively. There's been a resurgence in the stolen generations. So we see Aboriginal babies literally being taken out of their cribs in the hospital from their mothers. When, oh, under the auspices of child protection, when often these mothers just need some sort of support to, be able to enable them to keep their children. We've got a uh, horrific rate of suicide amongst Aboriginal youth. We've got a um, what seems to be racial profiling, in, particularly in the Northern Ter Territory, but also in other states, um, where we have, you know, in the Northern Territory, 95% of youth, uh, imprisoned youth are uh, Aboriginal. <coughs> um, I'm just wondering how, no matter how strong the question may be in the Constitution, how long how is that going to impact on these um, ghastly st statistics um, that uh, impact so horribly on Aboriginal people? You're, you're right, these are ghastly statistics. Um, and what, one of the things that, that is um, really worrying for me is that we're not shocked anymore by it. That Australians, we look at the sort of stuff like the Four Corner stuff and we go, oh yeah, it's pretty terrible, isn't it? I mean, it just washes over us. We're not outraged any longer about this stuff. 
Now, during this work, I hear repeatedly uh, my fellow Australians, non-Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, say, Mark, I've never heard about this in school. I haven't heard about it. And this, has come, this comes from about three generations of Australians saying to me that they've never heard about this stuff in school. And the reason why I, the reason why I, I just want to mention that is that we are still looking at a, a country that lacks the consciousness to say these people are our people. That what is happening to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, that's my people. They're my people. And that comes from all of us. Because if we start to see these ridiculous, ghastly, horrific statistics and see them as our people, then until that happens, we're not going to make any change. And I can tell you that, um, you know, there's a long line of, um, you know, um, learned people who've done lots of studies on whether, you know, bang for the buck and government spending in this way or that way and we'll recraft it and rejig it and we'll try to do it this way. The, the real challenge is that Australians need to see what's happening to the First Peoples as happening to their peoples. This is us. And the longer that I, you know, because whenever I see these statistics, I relate them to my own family. I relate them to my own family's experience of incarceration, my own family's experience of being removed, my own family's experience around education. So the, the, the challenge for me is that there are so many people who work tirelessly trying to correct this, but it won't be changed while the rest of Australia walks around and goes, oh, that's them. It will only change when the rest of Australia says, that's actually us. That's, it. that's our children being taken, and that's our people being locked up in prison because they couldn't pay fines, whereas other people get you know, warnings and they get opportunities to, to find some sort of debt relief programs, whereas Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, you can get locked up and um, for not paying your fine. It's those sorts of things that more and more Australians need to say, that's actually our people, and not so much, oh, that's the Aborigines, and we'll just leave it out there. This is one of the main reasons that I... The ability to talk about those issues in the context of constitutional recognition is one of the main reasons I support the campaign, no matter what the question is. Because, you're right, constitutional recognition is not about practically delivering on the fact so that kids are, you know, you know that's stolen, and I'm, there's been some stuff about but the money's being spent here. It's the same way they use the Aboriginal pot of money, the money to fight native title claims. Let's count that as Aboriginal money too, with a federal budget. It's, you know, this money was not going to be spent on something more positive. It's great that it's being spent on community education at all. And our job is to make sure that we can, that there is a national debate that's built up and we push it in the direction that we want to have. That we have a conversation about justice, the gap between rich and poor, and the history of this country, and we hang those issues off it. Because no matter what a national question, and even if we lose it, will mean a $100 million education campaign, it will mean people are actually talking about Aboriginal issues. And that's what, this is how they get away with it, right? It's an off to the side type thing. They had lots of reports in the NT about what was happening to those kids. You know, really, even the same kids. And it took some footage and, you know, that, and we're not gonna get that in all those other spaces. So we've gotta be creative. But this, this debate creates an opportunity for us to do that, even if it's not going to mean the practical stuff, we can make it mean yeah. something else. Look, um, I just wanted to mention two things that have been in the media. One was the war on drugs on SBS last night, which is well worth having a dip into on, um, you know, through the internet if you didn't see it. I think it was a repeat, but, uh, you know, the incarceration level of... Uh, Black Americans is just phenomenal, and the program concludes that the war on drugs is a war on the unemployed, the, the black Americans, and the indigenous Indians, and the um, white unemployed working class who've been displaced by by globalisation. Um, two other things I wanted to mention was a special program on. Skip, uh, not Skid Row, um, Curry Radio here in Sydney back in about um, three months ago, it was about April or May, where they debated sovereignty, uh, reconciliation and treaty. The standard of that debate was far more intelligent than anything I've heard in Parliament on the issue. 
and also the special issue of Away, which uh, Daniel Browning's one of my heroes, the guy that gets that together every week on Radio National. If you look up those two programs, it encapsulates the whole range of debate. Now, I throw that in its background because we know that it's going to be very hard for the Aboriginal community to be united over the question of reconciliation versus treaty because we saw when the Pat Dodsons of this world rocked up at Tony Abbott's lodge last year for the reconciliation thing, there were people here from Sydney outside saying, no, we want an ethnic treaty, we don't want a mealy mouth constitutional amendment. Now, that raises a tactical question of whether we get one first, i.e. the constitutional amendment, go along with reconciliation while we're still pushing for a treaty over uh, perhaps the medium term rather than the short term, or do we throw the baby out with the bathwater and forget all about constitutional amendments and reconciliation coming through that? It, that could be an educating process, but let's face it, it's majority of white and non-Aboriginals will be voting on this referendum if it comes up. And it's not the same atmosphere as 1967 with Craig Bandler and that pushing for Aboriginals to be counted in, in the census and to be given the right to vote and, and those fundamental human rights principles. There's a, there's a tension there between reconciliation and treaty. Now, I'm sorry I was late, but I was working to 7 o'clock and I sort of made a special trip down here. But that's essentially my question to the two panellists, whether or not we look at it tactically, the constitutional amendment and reconciliation, which has got a lot of financial backing from the federal government and other people, uh, whether we use that as an interim step towards a treaty or... Because a lot of... Aboriginals in Melbourne and Sydney are saying, you know, fuck off, we want a treaty. This is just Uncle Tom stuff, this reconciliation and constitutional amendment. And I think if there's not a consensus amongst the Aboriginal community, it's going to be hard to forge a consensus among the white community. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks for that. Um, the, the, uh, the idea, first of all, the idea of um, consensus forming, is really um, problematic. It's really difficult because there is a, a <coughs> mythology that, that we can find some sort of broad consensus. Um, the real question that we need to face tactically is when is enough enough? How many supporters for a proposition is enough? Because um, I, could, I could turn the mirror around and I could say, well, when I see consensus from the rest of Australia on this issue, then, then I might consider meeting you halfway. Where I cannot see consensus on the support for this, because I hear some of your, your people say that you don't want it, and I hear some of your people saying that you want it so much that, and then I hear other people saying, I don't even know what you're talking about. So the, there is a, the, the, this, this idea about, about consensus forming, is, is, is always problematic. But when we look at it from an Indigenous point of view, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, you're right that there needs to be some sort of firm idea to tactically move through these processes. I'll be very blunt with you. My tactic, my, my, my principle, my purpose for doing all of this work is that I fundamentally believe that we need to make progress together. Um, I think that our destiny as a, as a country on this land is together. And the only way that we can do that is when we find better ways to live and work together. So I don't subscribe to the idea that we need a deoccupation movement to actually say, uh, if you don't have Aboriginal and Torres Strait blood, thank you very much for what you've built here, but you need to leave. Um, I was introduced to that idea in Hawaii, where they were like, brother, we are com committed to a deoccupation. We don't want America to hear anymore. And I'm like, oh, okay. You know, but for them, in the sovereign, so their, their sovereignty in Hawaii, there's like, this is a kingdom here, and we never asked for the United States. But I don't subscribe to that as a way forward for the Australian Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander community, that we actually do a process of deoccupation. For starters, I married a Samoan, and she was uh, born in Samoa, 
And so I'd have to be looking at her and saying, look, I'm terribly sorry, my love, but it's time for you to leave. <coughs> so, I mean, that's a little bit facetious, but it, it, it is that idea of, are you, are you here because you want to work together with everyone else who's here? Or are you here because you actually want to stand so much against them that you don't even want to listen and work with them? Now, I'm, I'm of the, the tactic to say, whatever helps us to make progress together, let's, let's move that forward. Let's actually build a relationship. Now, on the specific matter of treaty and sovereignty and constitutional recognition and things like that, if the constitutional recognition work undoes any opportunity for other processes, then that's not a very smart thing for anyone to do because it closes the door for possible future improvement in our relationship together. It would be silly for Blackfellas to sign up to it because we close the door to any advancement for recognition of our own that this was our land. But it also is not smart and is ridiculous for the rest of Australia to do it because it closes you off from an opportunity to say our future is together. Now one of the challenging and difficult things to have to get our heads around is that when, when people talk to us about sovereignty or they talk to us about treaty, they say this is a more powerful lever, lever to, for us to have a you know, strong treaty. That's what we want. And they use the Treaty of Waitangi as an example, you know, in, in what happened in New Zealand. And I was looking at the Treaty of Waitangi and the first article in the Treaty of Waitangi talks about ceding sovereignty to the Crown. And I'm like, oh, wait a second, that's actually probably not a very good example of talking about the uh, treaty process. But the idea that treaty processes talk about is being able to have a more powerful relationship with the um, systems of, of state and, and Commonwealth government. Now, I can see that that's a desire to have a more powerful, um, uh, meaningful uh, dialogue and, and conversation about how we, how we do stuff together. I don't think anyone wants a treaty process where they say the first article of this treaty is we acknowledge, you know, we give our sovereignty to the Crown. Yeah. Um, however, we do need some sort of instruments that will help us to address some of these really challenging things about how we live here together. So whether a treaty is going to emerge, and I sincerely hope that some sort of process emerges from this, um, that is still, you know, that is still processes away. Treaty is an idea that has a long history, but it currently has no process. This is an idea that has equally long history, and it has a process that is, has a finality. You and I will go to vote one day. If this evaporates around us, it will be demoralizing, demotivating, we'll be scratching our heads. It'll be like we've crossed the bridge, like we did in 2000, and then said, oh, now what? Where do we go here now? So I sincerely hope that the, the, my brothers and sisters who are saying we need a stronger position of treaty, we need a stronger position of sovereignty, that they don't undo this process. That together with them, we actually make this as a way forward to keep our, our, our relationships moving and, and growing together. That's my position. Thanks very much. Right. Want to comment again? Yeah. Okay. I'll just be really quick. Um, I think just in terms of our futures being intertwined, I think Mark, more than 50% of Aboriginal Australians have a, non, have a non-Aboriginal parent. Our futures are absolutely intertwined. It's a bit of a, you know, yeah. yeah. But, um, you know, I just wanted to say, I feel like this treaty versus, obviously it's not an either or. I would rather see a treaty process anyway that didn't come from a government process. So this is the way I would rather see it come from a strength-based process of traditional owners saying this is what works and it being driven that way. This, whatever it is, is not a bottom-up process. It's a top-down government process. And I don't think that that should be a treaty process. I don't think that's going to work. But I would also, even if it is a relatively weak question that you look at, you go, oh, I wish it could be stronger. It might be like 67. People just remember that as that was the referendum where we liked Aboriginal people. Like actually, people think it did a whole bunch of things it did, didn't do. They remembered it as a vote because we as Australia like Aboriginal, and maybe that, that's what happened with this. If we have, even if we have a weaker question, we get it across the line. What will, I guarantee you the next day, what Australians will remember primarily is that was that we, we voted something positively about Aboriginal people as a whole country. So I don't know if we need 9%, and I'm not sure if I agree that it needs to be not a strong question to get more consensus, but I do think that, you know, as long as we get something across the line, we'll be right. Um, the final point I wanted to make about this 
treaty versus constitution. I think we have to be, and the consensus in the Aboriginal community, I absolutely agree with Mark. We need to grow up on the left, and I participate in several Greens forums where I often feel this at broadly, and get comfortable with Aboriginal people disagreeing with each other. And we're not, this idea that, and what I see a bit at the moment is I talk to this group of people and they were really opposed to it, but this other group of people over here, we need to be comfortable and recognise that Aboriginal communities strongly disagree with each other. There's many sources of power, there's many differences of opinion, and that we shouldn't say, well, I went to this particular forum or these few forums and I got this view. That's not necessarily indicative of the whole Aboriginal community because it's a very diverse community. The huge challenge will be because the gateway we've set um, I think in the Greens, I don't want to verbal our spokesperson, whoever our spokesperson might be after they have their cabinet meeting with all the new senators. Um, but the, the last time I spoke to Rachel Seward's office and talked about this question, it was like, well, there's a lot of value in this process. Um, if there is a point where the Aboriginal community no longer supports the question and there's genuine opposition, but I'm not sure how we work that out, to be honest, given the diversity. Um, I think that's a real challenge for us politically. As, as a member of the Greens, not as an official spokesperson for the Greens. There's been a lot of uh, talk about where things come from. So, in my mind, let's, let's go back a long way in Australia's modern history and look at Pemulwuy, look at Chandamara, look at Windradin, look at all these really incredibly legendary local leaders who fought for their sovereignty and their people came to a conclusion that they had to stop fighting and somehow survive against this dreadful onslaught of the invasion. But out of that resistance and that memory, we got 1938, we had things in the 1920s, we got things in the 40s and 50s, and we had 1967. So this call for recognise it's an Aboriginal people's call. It's not a whitey call. Whites would never do this. It's only a call from Aboriginal people. 1967 changed the constitution, like uh, Sylvie said, but really, when it happened, the gates of all the reserves in New South Wales were opened up and people flooded out to get a better life. And we, we know from the history, it's been a really tough 40 or 50 years that they've had but life is better and that's an Aboriginal people's movement so let's let's go with our history like that and one more memory is 1988 in Hyde Park when we had the, the fleet the fleet down there at the Opera House um, but we had I don't know how many people in Hyde Park 50,000 more I don't know and a huge number of Aboriginal people came from all over Australia to protest and Gary Foley was emceeing the whole affair and uh, he said, oh, I can see, I can see our future. All of, the, all of us are going to become Aborigines. So it's a little bit like Brand New Day. But really he was saying, we, we will win justice by a cultural change, by all of the people in Australia really embracing the Aboriginal history and culture of this land. So that's how I, I see where we are. Let's, let's grasp... Uh, the call that's come to us from Aboriginal people and make make this referendum happen um, and it will be a really energizing event for our country that's that's uh, a moment we're at we're struggling we're all struggling you can tell our forum tonight's all about a big struggle to get this to happen okay let's thank Mark Yeti Paulson and Sylvia Osmore